Good afternoon. Today's talk will be about peripheral neuropathy. And we have five learning objectives that we're going to try to cover in the next 45 minutes or so. The types of neuropathies that you're expected to recognize in clinic or in the hospital are listed in the learning objectives. So they're metabolic or endocrine, inflammatory or infectious, hereditary or genetic, entrapment or paraneoplastic, toxic or drug-induced. I have no disclosures. The problem that neurologists see is that there's a gap in care and that there are many causes for polyneuropathy, which means damage to the nerves in more than one limb. And the best way to get this uh, knowledge gap uh, filled in is to have a logical approach to how you evaluate patients. In neurology, we emphasize clinical symptoms, which is what the patient is complaining of, clinical signs, which is what the physician finds, and then the appropriate electrodiagnostic criteria. For peripheral neuropathy, it tends to be EMG studies as well as nerve conduction studies. And in some instances, you'll see two unique reflexes, one called the H reflex, which is the electrical equivalent of the ankle jerk, and then the F wave, which is a reflex talks about cervical cord function. We then mix that with appropriate lab tests. The problem is that the lab tests do not trump the clinical symptoms and signs. So you don't want to over rely on lab tests because their specificity is very low. You want to go with what you find on exam and what is the appropriate complaints by the patient. This is from up to date last year, and it categorizes various neurological situations based on weakness. So the first learning objective is that neuropathies can sometimes cause sensory complaints. Negative symptoms would be numbness. Positive symptoms would be tingling or paresthesia in addition to weakness. So today we're going to be focusing on this middle group where it says site of lesion peripheral nerve. The first group is genetic and the example in up to date is peroneal muscular atrophy. The one that you'll see in the slide set is called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease which is a particular form of hereditary sensory motor neuropathy. For inflammatory, we're going to see Guillain-Barre, and this is also carries the name acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, AIDP. And that's on the sheet that says E points. So on the front of your handout, it has the title of today's talk and then the differential diagnosis. On the back, it has two charts with the key points. What you want to do in the next 45 minutes or so is follow those key points and try to think of what the slides are trying to tell you that you must remember about those entities. So under Guillain-Barre, which is in the second set of key points, you'll see some key clinical uh, features which will help you to make that diagnosis. Continuing with the types of uh, neuropathies, under infectious, we're going to talk about leprosy. This is the most common infectious neuropathy worldwide. It still occurs. And if it's diagnosed in the United States, the people are quarantined in Louisiana. So this is not something to take lightly. Under paraneoplastic, they have uh, in this up-to-date uh, table, myeloma and amyloid. We're going to use amyloid and we're going to use um, the entity called porphyria. And we'll try to show you 
what's the relationship between that and neuropathy on exam. For toxic, you can have any one of the heavy metals, lead, mercury, arsenic. The one we're going to use today is thallium. And then the last will end up with uh, metabolic or endocrine, where the example is diabetes. In between the perineoplastic and the uh, metabolic, we're going to see two entities that are covered in the key points. One is B12 deficiency and the kind of peripheral nervous system problems that can occur. And then the, uh, the second will be um, those neuropathies that are associated with either MGUS, which is monoclonal gammopathy, or other uh, perineoplastic situations. So to begin, this is from uh, the last mix-up, not the current one, and it emphasizes in the middle part of the, of the chart signs and symptoms. So for neuropathy, you always want to look for complaints of sensory loss, which would be numbness, and then sometimes they'll talk about um, paresthesias or tingling. In terms of in terms of signs, which is what you see on exam, the most important diagnostic feature is diminished reflexes. Diminished reflexes. If you look towards the bottom of the table, where it says a reflexia, you want to star that in the key point slide on the back of your handout next to Guillain-Barre. The most important histo historical feature of Guillain-Barre is ascending areflexia. Ascending areflexia. They come in complaining of problems in the feet, and when you examine them, they have missing ankle jerks. The next day or so, they have missing knee jerks, and they may have ascending problems but they keep losing their reflexes. And that's a function of how long the, the process has been going on. Under hereditary sensory motor neuropathy, and you see that we have highlighted Charcot-Marie II, here the feature is the physical appearance, and you look for both high arch feet and hammer toes, and we'll show you what that looks like. So, this is from Netta, and it shows you an individual feeling for uh, hypertrophic nerves behind the ear, and then the cartoon trying to show the problem in the feet, and then a family tree on the bottom. This is a much better picture, and this is from the previous mix app. And you see that there is atrophy below the knee, and this is an example of the high arch. So here's the arch, and then here are the hammer toes. So that's what you want to look for when you're considering uh, a hereditary neuropathy with high arches and hammer toes. So if we go back to the table that we were initially in, which is the clinical correlates of uh, neuropathy number one, and you'll see later on in the presentation clinical correlates number two. The things you want to take from this chart are one, that diabetes is the big one to look for if there's a sensory motor neuropathy. So both sensory complaints and weakness. In the hereditary, look for Charcot-Marie tooth with those examples that I showed you. And then where there's a um, demyelinating neuropathy that's uh, progressive, look for either Guillain-Barre, which is AIDP, or 
CRDT, which looks a little different, it's more chronic. Do not forget your physical exam findings. And here, there are a couple of things on the skin that will help you. So in porphyria, leprosy, and in Refsoms, you may see some skin problems similarly in lupus. I don't have pictures, but in your textbooks or in your dermatology notes, you may have some examples. In neurology, we look at the nails. And you see here, they have knees lines with arsenic poisoning, and then lead lines in the gums with lead. Um, so look, look for that when you're checking your patients with neuropathy. The second part of the table on clinical correlates emphasizes an entity called mononeuritis multiplex. It means that there's more than one single nerve in more than one extremity. And the two examples are diabetes and neuropathy associated with vasculitis. Under um, severe hand sensory loss, which means they have trouble with uh, feeling, they have trouble with position sense, they have trouble with vibration sense, all of them are gone, and it ends up causing the person to have problems with their balance. It's called sensory ataxia. To differentiate it from cerebellar ataxia, which often, uh, when it's um, in the midline, can affect the trunk, and in the limbs can affect the, um, the finger-to-nose testing or heel-to-shin testing. Under autonomic neuropathy, which I may not get time to cover, today look for problems with orthostatic hypotension and with either erectile dysfunction or impotence. And here the individual may present directly to the urologist before you get a chance to, to see him. And in both situations, think of diabetes as well as amyloid. And then the last um, is a newly recognized entity called small fiber neuropathy, where the individual has a lot of discomfort. I had a patient last week that seen the internist, the vascular uh, surgeon, the neuro neuromuscular neurologist doing electrical tests, and uh, everything's normal. But the person is still having a lot of pain. And the interpretation by the neuromuscular neurologist is that it's probably small fiber neuropathy, most likely associated with diabetes, and it would be up to her internist to do either a GTT or other appropriate testing. But this is a real entity, and you should not take lightly the patient's complaints that their feet are causing them problems. So in general, and this is from a uh, teaching course that I attended at our academy meeting several years ago, but it has that approach that I was telling you will help you. And the emphasis is on clinical. What does the patient complain of, and what do you find on the exam? In neuropathies, unfortunately, there's about one in four in which there's no easily discernible type. And a lot of those patients get referred to special centers, and um, they will go through this uh, approach that, that I will be telling you about. The one in this particular course is by Dr. Saperstein at UT Southwestern, and uh, you'll see what his recommendations are. What he emphasizes in approaching these patients is to the far left the clinical features, and that's what you want to take away when you're working with neurology patients and you suspect the peripheral neuropathy. So if there's proximal weakness, think of CIDP. A lot of times we have the clinical saw, if the person's got proximal weakness, think of a myopathy, okay, a muscle problem. This is a unique 
neuropathy where you may find proximal weakness coming on almost like Guillain-Barre but recurrent. Okay? So consider that when you see somebody who is weak and you're not getting suggestions that either they have um, weakness that fits a muscular pattern or that the CPK is normal. And in those people, you want to do not only nerve conduction studies, but probably a spinal tap. And we'll talk about that in relation to Guillain-Barre. Both CIDP and AIDP are demyelinating neuropathies. So the key electrodiagnostic feature is that the nerve conduction velocities are slower than normal. Slower than normal. If there's axonal damage, the nerve conduction velocity may be normal. May be normal. But in AIDP and in CIDP, it's slow. If there's acute or subacute onset, then the other thing to add to that group where there's, there may be weakness is the perineoplastic group that we're going to cover in detail in a minute, and then B12 deficiency. And we'll tell you what the clinical features there are. When there's asymmetry of complaints, meaning one limb is weaker than the other, then you see that Dr. Stapestein has a list of conditions, and you see CIDP coming up again, then perineoplastic. And then an unusual entity called diabetic amyotrophy. It looks as if the person has had uh, muscle problems primarily. There's a lot of atrophy, and it's more proximal. It comes on either um, subacutely or chronically and it's confirmed when you get an abnormal GCT. So again, emphasize the clinical history and the clinical findings. This is a cartoon from Netter, which gives you the, the panorama of the different kinds of neuropathies. And here, there are a couple of common causes up at the top that you want to remember and try to fit it into that first page of the handout that has the differential diagnosis of weakness. So you see that they emphasize diabetes, and then alcohol, uh, uremia, and then drugs. One of the mnemonics that we teach the students, and I don't have a slide of this, is called BANG therapist, B-A-N-G, and then therapist. D is diabetes, A is alcohol, N is nutritional. Uh, the D can also be drugs, and there are specific ones here. INH, vincristine for cancer patients. There's not much use of hydralazine a lot. Where's Dr. Anderson? We don't use that very much anymore, unless you have to. Coming back. Coming back, okay. So you may see that as a side effect. Clinically, either you have a missing ankle jerk, or you can have a foot drop, like with a peroneal palsy. The person with severe sensory ataxia may need a cane. That's the one I said with all the sensory loss. You may have what's called stocking and glove, distally in the hands, distally in the feet, sensory loss. You may have impaired either vibration sense or position sense. A lot of the patients, particularly with nutritional neuropathy, and we're finding with HIV neuropathy, they have distal paresthesias, and they're reluctant to have a sheet or even socks on, so they keep their feet outside of the, the um, bed clothes. Um, in terms of which um, neuropathy is associated with eye movement problems, think diabetes, particularly if the pupil is spared. The clinical side is if the pupil is involved and it's a third nerve palsy, think of a mass lesion because the pupillomotor motor fibers in the third nerve are on the outside. So anything that pushes on it will make the pupil dilate. Diabetes can either give you a sixth or a partial third or a complete third, but the pupil is spared. <coughs> 
This is another list, an older version of Mixap, and some of the other drugs that can cause uh, a neuropathy or be associated with neuropathy. This, again, emphasizing the clinical features, which is the second part of this table that Dr. Saperstein composed, is if there's complete sensory loss that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the clinical correlates, then think of these entities. And this one looks a little bit unusual, but it's an entity that the neuromuscular people have come up with, and it's distal acquired demyelinating sensory neuropathy, symmetrical neuropathy. And you can see that it's often with some immunological disturbances on lab tests. The caveat is don't over rely on the lab test. Okay? And then you see that you can have it with tertiary syphilis. So the two that look very similar because of affecting the posterior columns and the dorsal root ganglion would be the neuropathy with babies and the neuropathy with B12. And we're going to go into that in more detail in a minute. What Saperstein feels is one of the clinical clues that will tell you that you're probably dealing with B12 is if you have sudden or subacute onset of complaints in the hands and the feet together. Think B12. The other one is CIDP, and if you remember from the previous table, CIDP, think of proximal weakness. And then we talked about small fiber. Um, and the patient that I had at MMA recently. So this is a practice parameter, and in neurology we follow these. They're always updated. This one from 2009 is still holding sway in what we follow. So here they talk about how you approach an entity called distal symmetric polyneuropathy, and in future slides you'll see it as DST. So it's the most common type and they have some numbers about prevalence. And what they're saying is that the most important is the history and the neuro exam. And yes, you man match up with the, uh, with the blood test. But look for uh, a good history and then the appropriate exam. The appropriate exam in a neuropathy is missing reflexes, particularly distally, so the ankles, and when it's involving the hands, the brachioradialis. So the key points are the ones on the back of your handout, and there are two tables. So as we go through the next set of slides, I want you to go back and look at each one. And so in this table, the main thing to star is the one down at the bottom, which is the DSP. And it's the most common. And what you want to think of is the D helps you think of diabetes. So it could be diabetes or it could be alcohol abuse or nutritional, particularly things like vitamin deficiency. And then in terms of genetics, um, what you look for is the physical features that we talked about with Chakamari tooth, um, with the high arches, etc. But then you have uh, slow nerve conduction velocities. The second group, which we're going to come to further on in the talk, is going to emphasize Guillain-Barre, then CIDP, an entity called critical illness neuropathy. So if you circle those three, when we come to them, I'll make sure and point them out. We'll pass through autonomic, because I said I wanted to emphasize the other forms of neuropathy. And this is the table that you saw at the start. For clinically symmetric uh, peripheral neuropathy, think of it in individuals older than age 50, problems distally, so toes, feet, then symmetric and progressive. And then what do you find? Symmetrical sensory or motor findings. There may not be a lot of sensory loss. 
And when there's weakness, it's primarily distal. Distal. So think of distal problems with neuropathy. Think of proximal problems with myopathy, except for CIDC. So Dr. Saperstein came up with this particular approach. And he says, if you see someone that you think has this uh, symmetric peripheral neuropathy, first look at their sugar, and then there's some other tests. So we'll do, we'll pass through the genetic because we covered that when we were talking about physical exam findings. The end of the genetic portion is talking about two entities amyloid and then you'll see porphyria in a minute. So for amyloid, they may have carpal tunnel syndrome and that's one of the entrapment neuropathies that the internist must recognize. Typically the individuals have trouble, particularly worse at night. Some of my patients say they wake up and they kind of wring their hands out hoping to get some lessening of the complaints. Uh, they have trouble controlling things like driving or operating um, the walker, if that's what they're doing, uh, typing on the computer, and in some instances it could be an occupational problem for people who are using the hands a lot, musicians, dentists, um, surgeons. We get really nervous when we see atrophy, and that's probably one of the times when we push the individual to go ahead and have uh, carpal tunnel release. To think about carpal tunnel, here's the thumb, here's the middle finger, here's the nerve. So it's between this tendon here and this one. So these two um, laterally in the, in the hand. And when there's atrophy or when there's prolonged nerve conduction studies, particularly in an entity called distal latency, then we recommend the individual have an operative uh, release. Temporizing, you can use drugs that help with neuropathic pain. You can put the individual in an extensor splint that they can wear particularly at night. Or you can give uh, injections into the, into the carpal tunnel. This is one of the tests, and you see here the individual has atrophy. If you compare the thenar eminence here, compared to here, and the individual has trouble with the um, abduction, with the adduction function of the thenar, whereas on the opposite side is perfectly okay. So that they're able to oppose the thumb to the fifth finger. This individual has trouble getting it from the thumb to the fifth finger on the right hand. Some of the amyloid individuals can have primarily sensory problems and um, they may also have some of the autonomic uh, complaints that I mentioned. For porphyria, you get um, a walk between the internist, the psychiatrist, and the neurologist. And what you're looking for is have they had behavioral disturbances? Have they had recurrent abdominal pain, and in some of the situations they may actually have, have uh, seizures. Typically on exam, what you find is primarily a motor neuropathy that's getting, getting worse. One of the lab tests that Dr. Saperstein recommends is the SEDRAID, but he admits that it's nonspecific and you only clinically worried when it's very, very high. Back to this table so that you know we're kind of following the different entities. So here we're going to talk about critical illness neuropathy and the concern here is whether or not you have an individual who can't come off the, the uh, mechanical ventilation that put them in the hospital with this severe, um, with a critical illness. Um, on exam, you find both sensory and motor complaints. And what you want to do in supporting them and getting both physical and occupational therapy 
is to stay away from steroids and stay away from neuromuscular blocking agents because it will make things worse. Often in that setting, the individual may have been put in the ICU because of Guillain-Barre, which is AIDP. So some of the AIDP patients who have progressed may require mechanical ventilation. And what you hope is that you can manage it, and we'll tell you how, without them ending up with this entity called critical illness neuropathy, which can be very tricky to diagnose. So in the handout with the key points for Guillain-Barre, so it's the second uh, block of key points. It says that it's progressive, and you want to write yourself a note, ascending areflexia. They often are preceded by a viral illness, particularly associated with uh, there we go, with um, D. jejuni. They may have had recent surgery. They may have had immunizations. And to confirm the diagnosis, you want to make sure that you do not only electrical studies after about 7 to 10 days, but also look at the spinal fluid. So here are five features that will make you worry that what you're dealing with is not the Ambaray. And this is important. So if they have a sensory level, that's not Guillain-Barre. Sensory level, think of a spinal cord problem. Okay. It's usually symmetric, so if it's primarily on one limb, may not be Guillain-Barre. If there's a lot of problems with bowel or bladder, think of spinal cord rather than uh, Guillain-Barre. And on CSF, it's very high protein, meaning significantly more than 45, which is normal and very few cells. You should never see a poly, and up to 10 limbs is normal. So if you have 50 white cells in the CSF, that's not Guillain-Barre. Okay. So this is a chart from the mix-up and the particular reviewer. And what they're saying is you follow these patients, so did they have the typical complaints? So they're symmetric, they're weak, and it's this ascending areflexia that I mentioned. Then you get one of your neurology people to see them, and they do the LP, and we talked about it. Notice that by two to three weeks, the protein should be sky high, and then the nerve conduction should be uh, low because it's a demyelinating disorder. The things that will require pulmonary critical care are covered in this particular box. So I'll try to walk you through them. And I don't see any of the pulmonary people. But you want to follow the vital capacity. You want to follow the negative inspiratory um, pressure. You get worried if the vital capacity or the negative inspiratory pressure starts to drop, particularly within less than a day of being admitted. And you're observing them to make sure they're not developing either aspiration pneumonia or problems with blood pressure and heart rate. There is an unusual form of Guillain-Barre which can descend, and that particular one has a lot of problems with arrhythmias, with uh, blood pressure maintenance and uh, can actually have cranial nerve problems. But typically, the sort of garden variety Guillain-Barre is the one that ascends, and then you've got to watch to make sure that it's not getting into pulmonary dysfunction that would need, that would require intubation. And if they are, then you're over here, you come down to intubation, and you're trying to get them off this as, mu as quickly as possible with the help of either um, plasma exchange or IVIG. One of the caveats while these patients are severely 
affected is to make sure that you're doing garden variety things. You've got them on um, pressure stockings. You're getting physical therapy to work with them. One of the patients that I lost when I was seeing patients at Crawford Long was a obstetrical patient who delivered, went home, and at home started to get progressively weak. She had um, high protein. She had distal weakness that was ascending. And we thought we were winning in that we were working with physical therapy. One Sunday afternoon, she crashed. And what we thought we missed was that she developed a CE in that she was bedridden and we weren't doing all of the um, management things to keep her out of trouble. Most clinicians will tell you, you remember the bad patients that you lost. And it was hard to explain to this person's family that she had a treatable illness, but we lost her. Very, very hard. So if you think you're dealing with Guillain-Barre, then get to either IVIG in this particular regimen or PPE. And here they talk about some of the studies and which is um, uh, beneficial. Most people don't combine them. It's either or. With PPE, you've got to work with the Red Cross. You've got to get um, enough plasma to exchange. Uh, it's a uh, major entity, and you're doing exchanges several times. See here? You're doing several exchanges over the first two weeks. So there's a lot of cooperation with not only the surgical staff that are putting in the long lines, but the physical therapists that are working with you with these patients. Um, and uh, the thought is that if you do it right and you do it early and aggressively, that you won't end up like my uh, young patient. The next entity, because it can occur in association with uh, HIV, is that HIV can be associated with either Guillain-Barre or CIDP. There's some other neuropathies, including that DSP that we talked about. And so I wanted to make a couple of clinical points about CIDP. We've already told you that it's primarily proximal. They have the same areflexia like, like um, Guillain-Barre. And the one that helps you to differentiate it from another entity called multifocal motor neuropathy is that you see a particular abnormality on nerve conductions that you don't see with CIDP or with AIDP. And the reflexes may not necessarily be as, as severely affected as with CIDP or with Guillain-Barre. So, you look for problems with the conduction velocity. You look for the CSF protein being elevated. And if you have to, you go to nerve biopsy um, and you look for a particular um, EM finding called onion bulbing. The major differential between the DSP and CIDP is that the DSP has more sensory and motor than, than CIDP, whereas the protein is higher in CIDP. The other entity that we mentioned is where you're getting more than one nerve being weak in more than one limb, and it's called mononeuritis multiplex. And you're going to see it in nutracy. You can also see it in porphyria. So here's leprosy, and you get these hyper nerves here behind the ear. You can get areas of patchy um, dysfunction on the face. You can also get it in the limbs, areas in the buttocks. And these anesthetic areas are where the, um, the um, entity has damaged the the feeling in the cutaneous nerves in that area. And it's 
it needs to be recognized and like I say if confirmed you need either by biopsy or other studies they need to be quarantined um, one of the students uh, was given this um, assignment which HIV drugs can cause a neuropathy and this is the reference and these are the ones to look for so DDI, Sidovidine, and Zalcibidine so when you're treating HIV if particularly if you're using the heart regimen and you start to have symptoms and signs that suggest a neuropathy consider that it could be the drugs in terms of toxic as I said we were going to use not only um, the heavy metals so arsenic lead mercury but also um, thallium that you'll see in a second so here are the Mies lines and this is a cartoon from Netter these trans horizontal lines in the nail beds um, with arsenic you can get it by clipping the nails or with getting hair samples um, one of my patients at a hospital that's no longer operative anymore doctor's memorial next to Crawford Long was a gentleman who was uh, having his meals at a female friend um, and she would always give him the food in a different uh, container than than what she was eating and um, apparently it was her way of uh, making up for the fact that he never told her that he was uh, um, legally married to someone else so arsenic can be a, a problem and um, you can see not only the alopecia but the abdominal pain and he always thought it was a little strange that but he didn't want to complain um, and then you can see stippling with some of the lead poisoning cases um, in uh, adults when you have it you tend to get the neuropathy in kids you tend to get seizures and then thallium which is another anti-alphanin rat poisoning you can get sensory problems and motor problems so we're almost finished with the table and uh, I'm conscious of the time we're gonna hit a little bit on diabetes a little bit on the um, perineoplastic ones and then stop so the other tests that Dr. Staffordstein recommended and remember we've covered SED rate and we've covered um, uh, B12 we're going to cover B12 the other one is glucose and here and this is from the mix app and they're different uh, entities that can be a, a neurological manifestation of diabetes and these are the signs on this side signs and symptoms so if you are concerned about that look for um, the fasting sugar as well as consider doing uh, glucose tolerance and see what the numbers come out and see if it matches what you are seeing clinically for B12 what you want to emphasize is how long they've been complaining about it and where it started so if it's sudden think of B12 if it's in both hands and feet think of B12 and you see the commonest is that one and then the second is that it's very painful the problem clinically is that not everyone improves after being put on either the tablets or the injections so if the nerve conduction velocities are normal you could still be dealing with an axonal neuropathy but when they're slow think of the myelinating and the ones you want to remember are AIDP and CIDP so for B12 it's common we talked about how it'll present what things to look for uh, sometimes you need to look for other entities than just the B12 level and I'll defer to the hematologist um, what they're saying is that you must consider that these other entities could be contributing to the low level 
And so the takeaway is look for it if the B12 level is less than 300, if these are elevated, and then the clinical history, sudden onset, hands and feet, the typical finding on the uh, MCV, and then were they having any GI problems that may have contributed to this entity. I'm going to go through the uh, abnormal proteins and stop so we can get questions from you. Um, you get concerned if in working up the patient and they're not fitting the metabolic type, the hereditary type, the, you're concerned that there's an underlying malignancy and then you start to do your testing. So you're looking for whether or not the M protein is elevated, you're considering whether you're seeing it filling into the urine, and are you seeing any lesions in the long bones? So um, you follow these patients, and then you're looking for immune markers. These are the four. Um, I have slides for the first three, and we'll go through them fast and stop. So for anti-hue, you're looking for associated problems with either small cell cancer of the lung or with these entities neurologically. Uh, in terms of the neuropathy, they can have both problems with balance as well as with uh, level of alertness. The second one, the GM1s, you look for um, the patients who you have excluded CIDP, but you're making sure that there isn't another uh, immune uh, disorder. Um, the rare entity is called monoclonal gammopathy, uncertain significance. Um, so they can have this demyelinating feature, uh, and when you do have the IgM elevated, it's usually this particular fraction. So the bottom line there is, if you had a patient with the demyelinating uh, symmetrical neuropathy and you don't find M proteins in the urine or in the blood, then consider this anti-mag uh, antibody. So don't rely too much on lab tests, but try to match it with your clinical symptoms and signs. We're going to pass on this and go to the end. So if you have someone with weakness and you have the uh, choices that are mentioned in the first page of the handout, look to see whether or not you're finding objective signs. And this handout, this table is not in your handout. Is it generalized or localized? If it's localized, is it asymmetric? So these are some entities. Or if it's symmetric, and that's what we were trying to emphasize in the time that I've been talking. If it's distal, particularly consider peripheral neuropathy and the test that we mentioned. So glucose, bed rate, B12 level, thyroid function. And this is one picture of an individual with a localized neuropathy and they have atrophy, etc. Um, that could be a cervical problem. They could have uh, neurofibromatosis, and that can be associated with neuropathies. This is a cranial neuropathy where the individual has this probably from um, varicella. I like to keep this slide because it has a date, and people sometimes think that a lot of clinical features are, are new. So when Dr. Jones, Roy Jones at the Leahy Clinic in Boston came up with this wonderful booklet, which is where I got some of those pictures, even back then they had good clinical features to help you know what kinds of neuropathies or muscular problems you were dealing with. So it's just a plea for old is not necessarily uh, incorrect or incomplete. 
Sometimes on carpal tunnel, you need to do sensory testing because it may precede motor and will pass on neuropathic pain in the interest of time unless you have questions. So we went through a lot and hopefully you got something out of it. What I would encourage you to do for boards and for things in the ward and in the clinic is to um, follow those key points that are mentioned in the, in the handouts. And I can take questions. Where's the chief? If you have questions you want to.